Okay. Okay. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, really glad to be here. Thank you, Mark, for organising. Um, so I'm going to take the approach um, a little bit like Jenny's taken. Uh, I was able to get involved with the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport and the Office for Students uh, last August on behalf of Lancaster Psychology. Uh, and this was a scoping review to look at how foundational data skills are being captured in undergraduate populations. And the reasons for this was um, because um, government have commissioned several reports and they're finding that this, this idea of a data analyst, a data scientist is really growing uh, disproportionately and exponentially. And um, you can see here that since 2013, the demand for these skills has tripled. And um, just before the pandemic, a report came out and 50% of businesses can't employ, can't recruit adequately skilled people. And these, the answer, the government's answer is to set up postgraduate conversion courses. Um, but now that the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport, DCMS Forever After, um, is wondering where their pipeline's coming from, where are their applicants coming from? because they, um, the actual Cognate subjects uh, that they consider Cognate can't feed that pipeline well enough. Um, so eligibility criteria were that we were a non-Cognate subject according to the DCMS. And this meant for this project that you were not computer science, not AI or data science based. Um, the university already had to be involved in the PG conversion course programme that the DCMS was already running. And you already had to have an existing strategic approach. And Tom has very nicely set me up there that we had um, our ongoing move to R since 2020. And we ended up being seven universities and I've just made a small map there. Um, you can see that we're quite spread, which is nice. Uh, not very much from the Southeast of England, which is unfortunate, um, but it is a scoping uh, project, very quickly set up, very short term. And basically they wanted us to find out three things. They, they wanted to understand how undergraduate students in non-cognate subjects are acquiring what they call data skills. Um, they wanted to test different methods of foundational data skill teaching. And then from that, they intend to build this knowledge base, which will be formalized in a report that's coming out in July or August of this year. So what are foundational data skills? And the DCMS put out their um, briefing document and they, um, they defined it as, as these four areas, data management, cleansing, enriching, modeling and visualization, but also quality assurance, validation and linkage abilities and statistical methods and analysis skills. So going into the project, I was pretty sure that um, we had the statistical methods and analysis skills covered. That would be a problem if we didn't. Um, Using R, I was pretty sure we had the management and the cleansing, but not maybe the enriching, definitely modeling and visualization. And in my experience of um, R teaching at Lancaster, and I was taught in 2014 on the second year of the move to R in the master's program, the quality assurance and validation, linkage abilities, that comes at a much higher level, um, master's and, and PhD. So this is what, this is the call we put forward. Um, I had four strands, there's five there, I can count, I promise. Um, we had curriculum mapping because we were essentially embarking on a new adventure and we wanted to see whether we were um, still quite traditional but just teaching through R or were we doing something quite new. Uh, often in department discussions, uh, the idea of prior learning having an effect on R uh, learning uh, comes up and we wanted to test this assumption you know, does a maths basis for um, prior learning in psychology um, help? And then there's always this idea that um, boys are better at maths that comes through secondary schools. So we wanted to test that assumption as well. Um, we, I, I, I pretty much knew the assessment structure we had, and I wanted to think about um, some kind of skills mapping that would allow these students to think about the kinds of skills that they were learning as they went along. So I was talking about making a self-assessment tool and then the traditional kinds of looks at, you know, the rich qualitative and um, opinionated data from focus groups and a survey of wider academic staff. And the academic staff here were not the teaching staff um, per se, 
they were academic staff who would have supervisor um, responsibilities for the third year project in this coming academic year. So I'll quickly take you through um, some of the results that have been sent forward for the report. And um, the first being curriculum mapping. And um, I went through um, each of the assessment types that we have, and I coded up the questions with the help of two research assistants. And what we have is we have weekly assessments, so we do have regular assessments, and then we also have summative uh, end of block learning tests. So in year one, that's four tests, in year two, that's two tests. The year one quizzes, the year two quizzes, they're open for a week, um, and students can have more than one attempt per question. So they really are formative in style of assessment. And here you can see that what we've got is four basic types of question. And you can see applied code, design and theory, and across all types of assessments, the applied questions and the theory questions are the most prevalent that we test. Code um, is basically tested somewhat and more in year one than year two. And then we've got an element of design that tends to come through in the tests more than the WBA type quizzes. And I was interested to look at what happened with these number of attempts. So here, what I did was I, I binned the um, answers by number of attempts. And on the top, you've got the year one WBAs, and on the bottom, you've got the year two WBAs. And I think it's very clear that you can see the, the majority of answers are answered correctly the first time. However, there's a difference between year one and year two, because in year one, they seem to get the answer um, correct on the third attempt, uh, and in year two, uh, this, actually, this behavior disappears and it becomes much more a first attempt than a second attempt. And I've interpreted that as a kind of trial and error in year one WBAs, um, and in year two, it becomes either a function of their longer learning or um, just a more systematic approach, the WBAs. All this is quite exploratory, so if we wanted to confirm some of this, we could try and set up some future investigations that were slightly more um, rigorous. And then I decided to look at the proportion correct for different types um, of questions. And this time I just looked at class tests um, across year one and year two. And what's really interesting is that um, different cohorts of students, but the same kind of pattern, which is that it's the design type of questions that seem to be answered the most correctly most of the time, um, followed by theory and um, applied questions across both year groups. And then the code questions. So this is across all of the tests. I know that Tom showed you some code um, stats in his previous talk, but across the tests, the code questions actually appear to be less likely to be answered correctly. So in terms of curriculum mapping conclusions, um, I found out that um, code and design isn't assessed across all of the tests and that code questions are less likely to be answered correctly. And it looks like we've got a trial and error strategy in WBAs, um, but there's, there's no real functionality of student co-writing at any point. We have this monoculture of assessment. So what about prior learning and gender? So I managed to get the admissions data from our admissions um, office before they dump it at the beginning of a new cycle. They never keep this data. And this tells us that very few of our students are coming in with maths A level although we do have a requirement of um, a B or a level seven at GCSE. And um, most of our students are coming in with some kind of prior learning at a uh, level three and um, A level or IB. Um, and then I did a transformation to look at our UCAS points because um, through the pandemic, we've had different kinds of admissions criteria. And one of the criteria we've offered this year is um, if students take us as their first choice there um, without insurance, then uh, we offer them a grade drop. So I calculated the UCAS points. And for this year, and it's a strange year because we know we have inflated A-levels, you can see that most of our students are above UCAS tariff. Um, the next is at, and then we do have some at grade drop levels. So what does it look like for entry-level skills of maths? I should say right at the beginning that none of these um, effects are statistically significant. So these are merely descriptive and trends. Um, it looks like that having some prior um, experience with maths helps on the WBAs, but that's pretty much uh, nullified in the class tests. 
again, psychology, prior learning of psychology, uh, you know, it, it swaps around um, in the WBAs and there's no real effect in the class tests. Though not statistically significant, it, it seems to be quite, quite interesting that the people at grade drop, which is the blue, um, do seem to be consistently higher. Um, it seems to be transferring to the class tests as well. Again, not statistically significant, but it's interesting to think, I like this as an underdog, um, you know, supporting the underdog, that maybe the students coming in thinking that they're a little bit lower, maybe work a bit harder, but that's not tested. We, we do need to investigate that. Gender, um, no real effect in year one this year. It, it appears that in year two, maybe the boys and um, the males are scoring higher, but again, not statistically significant. So, um, no advantage for prior learning at level three. Um, some trends that need to be um, further investigated, um, but overall, our two year programme seems to be a good general introduction. And just this week, I've been looking at the prior content, at the prior marks for the last four years, and it's pretty stable between SPSS teaching and our teaching. So, we've got a, a good range of the same amount of uh, grades by the end of their year two formal statistics teaching. So the skills maps, um, this was interesting, going to find the skills maps and the content of the skills maps um, took me into a deep dark dive into some interesting areas. Eventually um, I settled on this report by um, Riesdal et al, 2015, uh, and they gave me a matrix and it's got five broad um, areas for assessment that you can use on a skills map. I also looked at uh, data to the people uh, they called it databilities. Um, and I think this has been made a couple of times uh, today, but the people who feel confident enough to teach, um, which databilities here calls the coaches, are very, very small in number, 7%, compared to um, the broader uh, groups of people that uh, databilities calls curious or confident. So curious is the baseline that you know they want to know about it, but they don't know anything. Confident is that, yeah, they can do it for themselves, but they don't really want to teach anybody else. And then the coaches are the, the, the people who are leading the, the, the learning, the teaching. However, databilities have trademarked their um, framework, so can't use it because they've not got no money. So here's the framework uh, for the skills map. And you can immediately see that there's lots of sub competencies here that um, will map on very easily to uh, what you teach in statistics, not even R, but just statistics. And um, what's really nice about this is that the blue and the pink and the green, that shows progression. So if you do have students coming in, who do have some computer science at A-level, for instance, they've still got some way to go. Um, but it's also very basic. Um, so it's, it's a very inclusive structure. But no one came. No one signed up. I was so upset. Um, Talking with other members of the department and um, the way that uh, we go and look at our graduates and interview them once they've gone, it seems that they have a difficulty in isolating the softer skills that they've learned and being able to say, yes, I'm using those. They, they don't seem to think that they're using their psychology degree if they're not interviewed when they're in a psychology related role. So if there's that six month gap and they're waiting to get their um, job, then they'll say, actually, no, I'm not using my degree. And that's probably not the case, but it shows that we've got some work to do to um, sort of bring that language out and let them isolate their skills and know when they're applying them. And um, I'm going to implement this skills map um, next year in some way. Um, Jenny, I'd be very interested to talk to you. Um, so, um, and if anybody else would like to join that conversation, um, please give me a buzz too. Okay, focus groups. There's nothing new here, um, and it mirrors very much what Jenny found, although Jenny's was much more rigorous. Um, basically, the highlights were was that students felt they could claim very basic skills. They'd be happy to talk about it in a job interview. But I'm interested in the fact that they say basic, and I'm like, what does that mean? Um, before they arrived, they'd never heard of R, they'd never conceived of doing any computer coding. Two years on, they could see the value on it, but hated it at the beginning. Um, however, they didn't think they'd use it um, in employment after university. They said they wanted to help people and that data was desk work. 
anathema. Um, they loved the pre-recorded video lectures. Um, they liked doing it at their own pace. I do know it was an early look at user logs that not everybody gets to the end of those lectures. So that's going to be an interesting uh, deep dive into that data. Um, everybody said that hour long labs were too short. Um, the weekly WBAs forced them to practice. And I, I love that. Um, I love that language. You know, you've got to force me to practice, drag me to that uh, our studio. Um, and that they preferred to get the questions wrong. Um, they didn't know why they were getting things right. And I think that says a lot about how we are teaching them. And then by the end of year two, they were still not ready to help each other. They still were reliant upon um, answers from staff. Um, I think you mentioned, Jenny, the, the certainty. They weren't ready to embrace that uncertainty, which of course gives you lots of flexibility. And they, they, they weren't interested in engaging with that trade-off. So what I found from the focus groups was that um, the students view psychology very much through a practitioner lens. Um, but and we hadn't done anything to bring about the role, the supporting role of data for evidence-based practice in therapeutic settings if they wanted to be helping people. And they were not aware of the reach of their skills. They thought they'd pack them away at the end of their university degree. And it felt like um, we were a little bit out of step with the students. Maybe we're teaching a research focus and actually maybe what we need is an applied focus or you know a balance. And then there was very much this, we, we want certainty. And I think Jenny mentioned it in you know, that, that assessment. Uh, they're very focused on outcomes um, and, Really, one of the things about R is that it's so flexible and that we can be so, um, we can make decisions for ourselves. And it didn't feel like they were quite there. So our staff survey, uh, we have 31 supervisors in Lancaster Psychology, and we got a great range of people responding from senior researchers to early career researchers. And basically we had um, a split um, with, um, five to 13 years and one to three years experience of self-taught using R for research. And then about a third of the respondents with no experience. So we, on average, we'll, we'll look after about six students um, for supervision of third year subjects. So that's, that's round about a third of 31, that's round about 60 students who won't be able to have conversations um, concerning data analysis in their third year project. And I think Russell mentioned this this morning, you know, that, that truncation of conversations um, could be quite worrying. Um, we're planning an R support role, but that's 60 people at least being funneled to one person. And, and I think that could be problematic. This, the growth in the trainers as well because of the self-teaching means that uh, it could be too slow and the government might need to think about this if they're thinking about the economy and data science and data skills. I asked the staff to rank the desirable attributes in graduating psychology students. And you can see here that there are nine attributes. I won't go through them one by one. Um, but interestingly, they put the ability to carry out a research project at number four with knowledge and competent use of stats and knowledge and use of wider data skills practice below that. And that to me says there's a little bit of a disjunct between um, you know, what people want to happen with their data. Maybe they want somebody else to do the analysis or they want to be able to put it into SPSS, press a few buttons and the, the result pops out. So that might be uh, an indication that we've still got some work to do. Um, and just as a, a kind of byproduct, we can see that at number eight, then this is where the applied setting, the experience of an applied setting. And it's another sign for me that maybe we're a little bit out of um, step with what the students want and their aspirations and maybe what we're focusing upon. So in the staff survey conclusions, even though it's an anonymous staff survey, it looks like most of the staff with a student facing role uh, might be self-taught. So um, teaching the teachers is going to be a priority there. And then I think that we've really got to be careful of these reduced opportunities and make sure that actually we're supporting the staff to ensure that those conversations are occurring. So, um, teaching statistics through R, um, there doesn't seem to be any cost in terms of statistical knowledge for the difference between R and SPSS. So the added value is, is the learning to code part, the flexibility, um, and they learn an awful lot. 
but they don't know what they've learned by the end of the training. At least that's what I'm getting from Lancaster. And so we're looking at explicit methods. And it's been mentioned quite a few times um, this today. So my idea is triangulation. Um, the first two sides are pretty much um, in place or ready to go with the traditional tests and the skills mapping. I think that the skills mapping will give students language. I think that we've got we've got to be able to give prizes, so we still need traditional tests to be able to rank the students. Um, but I also know. See you later, noisy fellas. But I also know that Project Here um, has done some work on um, working with industry and project based work. And that sort of chimes in with what was saying, what was being said with um, some people earlier. And I think that's a really interesting way to go, maybe as an elective in third year. Um, but that's that's a little bit way down the line. Thank you very much. And um, I hope there's some questions, uh, but I'll be here till the end of the day as well. Thanks. Great. Well, thanks very much. That was excellent. Um, so uh we have a few minutes if people would like to ask emma any questions directly and if so just 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 raise your hand and maybe while we're we're waiting i will um i will ask a question and that's okay um so <laughs> <laughs> well i had two two questions and just kind of just real kind of thoughts and they they, they were ones that uh, kind of came related to things that you said throughout the, the talk but you kind of mentioned them at the very bit them at the very big end as well and so one is just the topic of teaching the teachers and um that is i i think a, a particularly important thing I, I found it really interesting what you were showing there about uh how what seven percent of people could be classed as coaches and that and that was people presumably with with sufficient expertise and confidence uh, but then there's a larger number who who would be um not quite there and i think the, the teaching the teachers is is something they one of the, the one of the, suppose, the key things the key problems with that is that sometimes teachers are not the best students if you, if you know what i mean teachers are often they don't often want to be students they they maybe prefer to teach themselves or they they um or, or they may not be particularly motivated to 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 learn uh, new things and so i was just wondering if you have any comments on on that particular point teaching teachers and um, i think and um, please any anybody else weigh in because it's quite general and um, i think in the staff mm. survey that um, came back from Lancaster, there was very mm. definitely um, a portion of the answers, because that, obviously that wasn't all the answers, that had this kind of inertia. And I thought, okay, you're gonna be hard to move. So mm. really we're looking at you know, a small tranche. But I think also Tom pointed it out in his um, pie charts that it's the uh, postdocs and it's the PhDs that are coming through. Yeah. And I don't know if people are seeing um, a difference in the recruitment cycles in their universities, but I've just been employed on a teaching associate post. Um, I don't consider myself a coach. I'm very much a confident um, person, but um, I think bringing those people in and um, letting them get their feet wet with teaching on a contract before they go off somewhere else might give people the space to do that. And if I don't know if departmental uh, mandates for professional development happen in academia. They're certainly doing state education. Um, so somebody would have to advise me about that. But if if you could get a smaller cohort of people together um, and be supportive, that's that's been the, the mantra for today, hasn't it? Keeping the conversations open um, and bringing people to the, the, to the desk and then formalizing it a little bit more. That's probably going to be the way, because we're not quite there yet, are we, in terms of the tipping point? Um, yeah. I, I find that some people, um, they just, for one reason or another, they don't want to learn uh, R, and, uh, and for those who do, uh, for teaching purposes, and for, for those who do, I think that um, it's quite, well, we, we, can, we can set up staff training for them relatively easily, um, but, it's, but the, so, so it's not as if we having, are having difficulty providing the, that training it's it's requiring the staff to to see the value in it and buy into it i think that's the the biggest problem that i've seen and if you if you know how to require somebody to see value in something yeah. I'll, I'll pay for that 
Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Um, okay, so does anybody, would anybody else last, like to ask any questions to Emma? I think there might have been a few questions there in the chat that, that were directed at you, Emma, but I'm not sure. Um, so, I will look oh, oh, James has a question. James, go for it. Hey, James. Yeah, thanks. Really enjoyed that. That's really interesting. Um, maybe I missed it. Like, so you got the, the staff to do the, like, the ranking exercise on like, these are the skills we would like people. Did you do the same thing with the students? No. Hmm. I'll say no. that would have been interesting to see, like, here's what staff value, here's what students think would be valuable. But, yeah, that's a shame. But, yeah, really liked it, nonetheless. Thanks. Um, I, I did the value of R from that perspective, and that went into the employability. So not one of the students that was in the focus group, um, and that was year one and year two, not one of them were thinking of being a researcher. Um, it seems to be conversations that happen in third year, maybe after they've done their third year project, and then they go, God, I hate research. Mm. Or, yeah, no, research is for me. It's, it actually, it's, it's a viable pathway. Um, so, again, you know, we're in, we're in the middle of something. So the real proof of the pudding for us, because we're not assessing, assessing functionality of code, um, is the third year project. I'm really interested to see how they do next year. Okay, great. Well, I've got a few other questions for you, Emma, but I will I will wait uh, until the general discussion. <laughs> um, okay. And so I think that we'll probably um, end your your talk now. So I will stop the recording.